Hi, my name is Brent Cadler. Welcome to another episode. I call this one Before the First Race. And today we're gonna to go over all the work required to get a go-kart out of storage and ready to go before, the, before you go racing for the season. This is also really excellent uh, if you have a brand new cart, you're gonna go over a cart for the first time. Um, there's a lot of work required to make it all come together. Make sure you leave yourself a good four to six hours to go through everything. Um, it takes a little longer when you're filming and doing videos like this, but uh, but if you just have a pop and you're you know working by yourself in the garage, probably a half a day to do all this work. Um, so let's get into it. It's going to be a bit of a longer video, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the information. Leave any comments you have below, and uh, let's get started. <music> don't know where to start we have a lot to go over here we got a new brand new bumper we got the motor that's all rebuilt brand new chain guard bumper mounts battery air filter clutch sprocket chain carburetor it's all here ready to go and we got to get it onto the cart the first thing we're gonna do is go over this cart and make sure that's ready it just came out of storage Give it a quick wipe down, vacuum out the seat. Take the plugs out from under the plastic bag so they can get, uh, just make, give them a look over to make sure they're not all corroded and everything's good. And we'll finish at the very end by doing a brake job and having a look at what we need to do on the brakes. This season they have a brand new Micron that's going on. So we're gonna remove all of the existing wiring. I'm gonna package it up and we're gonna get uh, the new Micron wiring put in place. Okay, so now is a good time to go over your wiring harnesses and your throttle cable just to make sure they're in good shape. If you do need to replace them or do any maintenance on them, now's the time before you get into racing and before everything gets on the cart and it's all busy and tucked in the back, it's all open and exposed right now. So here I'll have, I'll, I'll let you see. So you can see here the throttle cable, it's all nice and exposed. It's all good, there's a little bit of rust happening here, but I can just put some WD-40 on it, it's in good shape and all the way to the back, and it's all clean and everything's good to go. And the same thing with your wiring harness, if you're ever gonna see anything that's wrong with it, or if you wanna clean it up or work on any aspect of it, now is the right time. It's all very accessible and exposed, so do what you need to do with your wiring harnesses now. So the next step, we're gonna wire up the cart with all the Micron uh, wires and reaffix all the wiring harnesses where it needs to be so that it's good for the motor to go on and we can start actually assembling things. Okay, here is the new Micron. And we're just gonna open it up and have a look at what's inside. There's a couple different versions of Micron. I didn't know about that when I bought this one. I just said, give me a Micron 5. There's a 1T and a 2T. And it looks like, I have no idea which one I got. It says 2T on the manual, but I'm pretty sure I only got a 1T. Okay, so that's the Micron there. And it comes with the uh, cable for the uh, engine speed sensor, which we'll put on the cart. And it looks like it comes with a battery. Charger, and there looks to be a extension cable. That is the engine water coolant temperature. And a USB cable, excellent. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna do the uh, uh, engine temperature cable. We'll put this on the motor and this will go into the cart and that's what we're gonna wire right now is make sure the cart is all wired up. So between this and the engine speed sensor, uh, we'll get those wired in and then we'll come back to the rest of it. Okay, 
Okay, so we got the wiring. So we've mounted the Micron is now on the steering wheel. It's just a single, it's just a single bolt in the back. Connected the wires and just made sure that there's enough room that they can spin the wheel at full range without having any problems. If you do, see this is a little bit tight here, it'll probably give a little bit more space. You wanna make sure there's enough room that if you crank the wheel all the way over, you're not pinching or binding or pulling on the wires. I just run mine, I just run mine down the side here like this. I've used a little bit of fuel hose just to kind of keep them tucked together. Um, and it also provides a little support for the wire so you're not pinching it at any points where you're zip tying it. Wires all come together into one spot here and then you can decide to either mount it to the frame or you can put it up to the side of your chair or whatever makes sense based on your motor configuration. So that wiring harness is in now. Um, we're going to get on to the next step and uh, yeah. So we got the new water temperature sensor. We're going to swap it out for the old one, which is right here on the top of the cylinder. I'm pretty sure they're the same sensor. I think they'll work between years, but I paid for a new sensor. Why not use the new sensor? So we'll just quickly swap out. There we go. As you can see on the motor, pretty well ready to go. The oil is already filled. That was done at the shop. And just to do a quick one over of how you would fill that oil is you seal all the bolts up and there's one bolt on the side. This bolt right here on some of the older motors, you can just fill up to this bolt. On the newer motors, you just do a measurement and it tells you in the, in the manual how much to measure. And I don't remember how much it is. I think it's 100 cc's of oil. Yeah, it says right here on the side, 100 cc's of oil. So you just measure out 100 cc's and pour it in. Pour it right in the top. So once you have that done, you're basically ready for the motor to get on. So I'm gonna talk about the motor for a few minutes. Uh, I had this motor sent in to Overdrive Motorsports to get rebuilt for the season. Um, at the end of last season, I had water leaking out the back. There's a weep hole on the back side of the motor, which I'll show you. And it weeps out of there if one of the seals in the crank in the bottom end starts to leak. It's kind of a telltale hole. And I'll see if I can show it to you quickly. So down right there is a hole. And that hole right there is a telltale hole that'll start weeping uh, coolant if there's a problem in the bottom end of this, uh, um, there's a couple of seals back here and it, if one of them fails, it'll start weeping. And that'll be time for basically when you need to get the bottom end of your motor replaced or worked on. Um, so while I had that motor there for the bottom end work, I also had them do the top end and basically a bunch of work. So we had the bottom end done, new, new bearing uh, on the crank. Um, <clears throat> New, pist new cylinder, new piston, new rings, um, a bunch of, there's a gears and stuff that get replaced in here. There's a bunch of stuff that happens. Um, the total cost of this rebuild was about 1800 Canadian dollars, which is a little bit more than normal because I had a new cylinder put in. Typically it's a few hundred dollars less than that. Um, you can expect $1,500 Canadian every two or three years or so. Depends on how competitive you want to be. This year I'm going to try and go for some podiums. So I wanted a complete rebuild. So this thing is, as good as can be. Um, before we get going, we're gonna just get this thing filled up with coolant. Um, I just have a pre-marked up bottle where I've marked up some measurements. And if, because we're in Canada and it does get below zero, it freezes here, we're gonna do a 50-50 water glycol mix. Um, most of the cart tracks in Canada allow for glycol water mixtures in the, in the motors because of our weather. In the United States, you have to be careful. The cart tracks, check with your local track some of them will only allow water and some will, some will allow mixes. It depends on your local cart track. So check with them before you get going on filling this thing with coolant. And one thing I forgot to mention, hopefully that shows up, I think it's showing up backwards. It should say deionized water. Um, you only want to use distilled or deionized water. 
You do not want to use tap water. Okay, now we're going to do the next step, which is I'm going to get the carburetor back on the engine. And to do that, you should, we, we took this apart and cleaned it before it went into the winter. Um, if you need to rebuild it, do so. And I'll do a separate video for that another time. Um, I just like to take the cap off. Take the slide out and have a look at everything, make sure it's okay. Make sure it's all clean, there's not a lot of dust and stuff inside. If you do need to give it a spray, use carb cleaner. Don't use WD-40 or any oils, because um, you don't want that to gum up your engine or your carb. Um, just a dry cloth, and if you need to, some brake cleaner. The bottom bowl, um, you should have checked it redone all the seals and, and looked at that in the fall um, so it should be good to go now <clears throat> and all we're going to do is just mount it on the engine pull out your little cap and stick it on So it just sits on the bottom like this. And it just goes in there and there's uh, one little cl uh, clamp that you can tighten up and it's just a little uh, Phillips screwdriver, so to speak. Make sure it's nice and vertical and we'll tighten it up. Okay, now the fuel hose to connect here. Uh, do this in accordance with um, the Rotax manual. And I'm just looking for where my spare fuel hose is because I do need to connect the uh, fuel pump to the carburetor. Okay, now the fuel hose is on, you're going to want to secure it with something. I use zip ties. Um, you may need to use lock wire. Check with your uh, local race officials to see what they require. At our club, we're just allowed to use zip ties. It's fine. And on this one, because I couldn't quite get it over enough, I will use lock wire on this one. Just because it doesn't require as much um, exposed pipe thread or, or um, fuel hose to, to be nice and secure. And the lock wire, all you're doing is basically wrap it around and then twist the end until it's nice and tight. So that provides a bit of a backup for that, uh, for that connection. Perfect. And then what I'll do is just, once it's twisted up, I'll cut it off and then fold it over just so it's nice and, and kind of closed. You'll be able to see that nicely right there. Oh, 
Okay, so that's done. Now we're going to put the motor onto the cart. So now that the motor is roughly in position, we're just going to spend a few minutes and go over the wiring and make sure everything's all buttoned up. Okay, so you can see that there's the, the wires are all connected up. All the connections are made back here. There's one underneath here that's made uh, down under there. Um, and now, so now it's just a good time to go over this harness. Um, we've made this ground connection here. And if you have the newer style Rotax, some of these will be different because this computer module has been moved up over by the battery. So the harness might be a little different based on which engine you have. And really what we're trying to do now is make sure that all of these wires are not going to contact the rotating elements and they stay out of the way. So we want to make sure that everything's kind of all tightened this up a little bit. And we'll put some zip ties in here just to keep the harness secure and in a in a nice spot so it doesn't actually um, contact anything or move around too much. Okay, so we'll zip tie up the harness a little bit uh, and then I'm going to start putting this micron stuff on. So we're going to put the harness on for the uh, water temperature sensor and for the engine speed sensor. Um, and then we'll start working on fuel hoses and stuff. We've now zip tied the wiring all the way along the edge of the seat, underneath and up. And we've also zip tied in our fuel hose and made all of our connections there. So everything looking pretty good. The next step will be, we might as well get this uh, throttle cable put in place. So this I have zip tied loosely down here and we're gonna get it wrapped up and over and we'll see how it looks if we need to zip tie it in a few spots and try and keep it relatively loose and uh, I'll have a look what that looks like. So I'll throw a cable through the cap. Okay, so we got the spring in there, followed by this little guy over top of the cable. So it goes on like this, and that goes all over onto the slide. And make sure your needle doesn't get bent. And this goes into the carburetor. Now it'll only go one way. So if you get it wrong, it'll be the other way. There. So you can see it's the gap to the front, flat on the back to the front. Voila. Now, you're going to want to check your pedal movement. So you're going to want to pull the pedal and make sure that the slide is opening and closing properly. So you can see it happening in there. It's opening and closing nicely. It opens all the way and it closes all the way. And that's what you're looking for. Okay, uh, this throttle cable, it's somewhat secure here. 
I think I'll put one little zip tie here and that's likely it. It doesn't need very much. It's pretty rigid. So I'll just put, I'll just attach it here with one little zip tie and that's it. So I'm going to want to get the sprocket ready to mount next. And I'm going to change the sprocket. This is an 85. I'm going to go down to an 81. Got a brand new motor. Uh, an 85 is a little bit too tall for our track. Um, so we're going to swap this out. Okay, now we're going to mount the sprocket onto the rear axle. Before we do that, we're just going to spend some time with the rear axle, make sure it's nice. It spins free. We did check on this in the winter, so it should be okay. You can see how easily it spins. You kind of want that for yours. Next is the key. I'm going to insert the key onto the axle. And then we're going to throw this in place. It should go on fairly easy, and if you need some help, you can put a little uh, oil um, onto it. Now, this doesn't have to be perfect because we are going to be aligning this later, but you do want to get it relatively close. And then just temporarily line it up and, and screw the bolts in because we'll be adjusting this again later once we actually get a chain on here. So for the chain, you have really two kinds of chains you can use. You have a gold chain or you can have the blue chain, which has the O-rings on it. There's a little bit of controversy over which one's a better chain. They both kind of have pros and cons. The gold chain definitely has lower rolling resistance, but the O-ring chain is apparently better under load and for certain types of applications. I think it's a bit of a controversy in the karting club as to which one's a better chain. Um, I typically like to use the O-ring chain. It's a little heavier duty, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. What do you think is a better chain? Use some uh, road racing uh, chain lubrication, give it a quick spray. And we'll put the chain on. Okay, the chain's in place. Now, obviously the motor is not in the right correct spot, but the chain's in place. And what we can do is uh, next step will be to um, actually get the motor in the right spot. Um, and then we'll worry about making sure the alignment of the back sprocket is correct. So let's go ahead and get the motor in the correct spot. So these go on the bottom side of the motor and they plug into the bottom. I'm just gonna put those on the chassis now. Okay, so those are both on the bottom, but they're just there loosely because we're going to be moving the motor. Next, we're going to be getting in here and we're going to be using that little uh, stopper and we're going to use that stopper to push the motor forward until we get the right tension on the chain and then we're going to bolt under the bottom and tighten it down. And it should be at the correct tightness once it's bolted down. Um, you don't want to make sure that it's tight and then bolt because it does change the tension once you bolt it.
Okay, that's about the right tension there. Um, maybe a little bit tight. But now, before I tight, do anything else, I'm going to make sure this is perfectly aligned so that that's correct. So we're going to take our flat edge, we're going to stick it on, and we'll make sure that it's lined up with the front sprocket to the back. Once you have it nice and lined up, then just give it a tighten and torque it all down. Okay, now that's tightened down, we're going to go underneath, make sure check or double check our chain alignment. So we want about a half an inch to an inch, which is about that. Arguably, maybe a little bit more. This chain has been used before, so it's already, if there's any stretching, it's already happened. So I can go right to the right. If you have a brand new chain, you might want to put it just a little tighter. But um, yeah, that's perfect. Just like that. So it's a nice movement. Okay, so that's fairly tight now. I'm just going to double check the tightness. It's probably a little tight. I'm going to loosen off just a bit. Okay, that's perfect. Just like that. Just a little loose. It's perfect. Now, that rubber stopper in the back, we're going to tighten that bolt in the back so that it's right to the edge so it doesn't go anywhere. So we'll tighten the rubber forward and we'll tighten the nut behind it to the back. So that way this gets as a stop. It's a secondary stop so the motor doesn't move or shift. And you don't have the chain tightness adjusting as you're trying to drive on the track. There we go. Okay, so now on to the next step. Okay, maybe that was a lot more loop. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna go and put the chain guard on. So the chain guard's kind of pinched in on the sides, so I'm going to have to take it off and then get the hair dryer and kind of stretched out a little bit. But it'll work. Um, okay, so I'll leave that for another day. So now that everything back here with the exception of the chain guard is sorted out, we're going to mount the exhaust. Um, the exhaust is held on by a couple of bolts on either side. Your exhaust may be a little bit different. They're all a little bit different. Get how, how they mounted based on your chassis. I'm going to loosen up the bolts so I can move this whole thing forward about a half an inch or so. And that way this connection here can be nice and tight. As the motor moves forward and backwards, your exhaust will have to move with it. Um, and make sure your exhaust is relatively free so you'll have rubber isolators on the bottom. And I'll see if I can show you what some of those isolators look like. You can see the rubber isolator back there. And you really do want your exhaust to move. So you don't want your exhaust mounted in a rigid fashion. You want it to be kind of a balance between rigid and motion. You do want your exhaust to flex and move. That's why you see the spring hangers here and you see a pivot joint up here is that you do want it to be able to flex and, and adjust. Um, your cart chassis moves, the thermal expansion happens, so you don't want everything to be tight. 
Um, okay, so we're just going to loosen these two bolts and I'm going to suck this forward and we're going to attach two springs to the engine so that this gets nice and tight in here. Okay, so now this is pretty free to move. Okay, here we go. Now comes the fun part. So we have these two springs. We're going to go right from here to there. There's one. And there's two. Now, that looks pretty easy for me, but I can tell you that it might be tough, and in which case, you get some help with a stronger guy or um, if you're really struggling with it, you might look into maybe, do you have the right springs and the right exhaust? Maybe you're missing the gasket or you've got a thicker gasket than you're supposed to, but they can be tough, so practice. Now, we're just gonna tighten up the exhaust back to where it is now, and then that'll be done. Okay, the exhaust is on nice and tight. Um, we replace that sleeve in the winter. If you ever need to right now, you just undo these bolts. You may have rivets here, in which case you drill them out. This pulls out and then in there is a fiberglass sleeve, which you can replace. And I think there's, they sell them for $15, $20 to get a new sleeve. And you should do that maybe once a year. Uh, I did mine in the fall, so it should be fine. So I was able to get the guard back on, uh, just require a little bending just to make it fit properly. Now I'm going to put a catch can in place and the catch can comes off the oil breather on the side of the Rotax and it fixes to the back of the cart somewhere. It's just to show you how I've done it. I've fixed it to the oil breathing on the outside of the engine and it just runs back and I'm just gonna zip tie it to that, that member on the frame right there. And that's it. And it's just there to hold any oil that comes off and that's required by the regulations. So I'm just gonna go ahead and zip tie that. Okay, just zip tied the uh, uh, wire, wiring harness and the uh, oil catch can. Now I'm just going to go around and uh, trim off all the zip ties. Make sure they're tight where I need to and then trim off. We're just about done with the back side of the cart. The only thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to fix the rear tire. And I'm just going to put it in roughly in place. Um, before you get on the track, you're going to make sure you're equidistant and at the correct dimensions of the width. So don't forget your key. Now remember, like we said before, 
these go on super tight. As tight as you can get them without stripping them, obviously. So we're pretty much done in the back of the cart here. The only thing left to do really is the brakes and we're gonna to get to that later. So now I'm gonna take some time to go over some other things that just need to be reviewed um, before you get going on the track. So your side bumpers, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they're relatively in good shape. Um, they're not too critical. They can last a long time, even if they're bent up. The front bumper usually gets a lot of wear and tear. So the front bumper on the bottom side, you can see here, I have some racing damage here. This was thanks to one of the guys at the track, but you will want to pay attention underneath here. It gets quite a bit of scuffing and damage because you're loading and unloading the cart. And you can see I've already got a crack starting there. Uh, but this bumper is okay for now. But you're going to want to check it and if you need to, replace it at the start of the season. Um, make sure it'll hold up for the rest of your season. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is make sure your front bumper is secured properly. So this one has these cl clips that, uh, that kind of snap on. Um, and they're really good. They come on and off pretty easily, but they do need to be uh, zip tied in place. So I'm going to take some time and zip tie them in. They're famous for coming off and going skittering down the track. And you want to make sure that doesn't happen because it can be pretty problematic if you lose your front bumper. Uh, and these clips are actually pretty expensive. They're, you know, 20, 30 bucks each to replace. So, um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to kind of zip tie those in place so that even if the clip comes off, it's not going to go flying down the track and we're going to lose it. Hopefully you've kept your battery in a relatively warm and dry spot over the winter, so it's in really good shape. It doesn't require any deep cycling or any maintenance. So it just flops in there pretty simply. Be careful when you're doing the positive, because if you contact the um, chassis, you're gonna be a little bit of sparking. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. Okay, so I did the positive first. You don't have to, but I like to. Um, the other thing is to make sure your switch is off. You do not want this in the on position before you begin the next contact. I like to touch it before just to make sure there's no static or discharge. Make sure they're both nice and tight. Now there's two prongs on the front. They go here and on the back, so make sure you get the front prongs. If you miss the front prongs, what will happen is during your race, this will pop off and... <laughs> yeah, not, not, a, not catastrophic, but pretty disconcerting if you're on the grid trying to get out there and all of a sudden your cart's falling apart. It's kind of distracting the cases. Off, loosen your hand when you're trying to get gridded up and go and there's obviously not enough time to go the right tools to fix it so you're just hoping it hangs together <laughs> okay I'm just gonna pop it just to make sure it actually is connected and turns over and it doesn't so so why not? Is it because I have a short in the harness? Is it because the battery is dead as a doornail? Or is it because I didn't connect a wire on the uh, harness somewhere? I'm gonna have to troubleshoot it. It should just pop over. No, there it goes. Okay, I guess it's just a switch. Look at that. 
Okay, I'm gonna make sure this battery is all topped up and charged nicely. The next step is we're gonna bleed the brakes. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about maintenance back here for the brakes. Okay, so for the brakes, you're gonna need a few things. You're gonna need fluid. I use Motul um, and it's dot four. You can use dot 5.1. Do not use dot uh, five. You'll need a, I usually use a fuel hose. Um, you're gonna need an Allen key to get into the reservoir. And you're gonna need either a 10 mil socket or what I like to prefer is I've gotten a brake bleed kit and it's a socket with a nipple attached so I can actually put that over top and then use um, you can just use a 10 mil socket though, it's up to you. Uh, and you're gonna need a bucket to catch your fluid. So the basic process, it's a one person job. It goes, you can do it with two people, it's easier, but you only need one. We're gonna remove the cap. We're gonna pump fluid from here into the bucket. And we're just gonna fill this up and pump. We're gonna do two times on each side, at least two times, if not three, just to try and get new fluid in here. And we're just going to try and keep going until we get new fluid through the whole system. Brake fluid absorbs moisture and you need to replace it every six months minimum. Especially in this application where it can get hot and boil and then you lose your brakes altogether. So don't cheap out on this step. This particular thing here, it's a good time to check your pads to make sure you have enough pad left and your rotor. So this rotor still has a lot of meat on it, but you can measure it. Um, and then on the pads, you can just visually inspect the pads you can see so these pads actually will it actually focus and show I'm not sure if you can see it the pads are almost toast there really isn't a lot left so I'll show you what a set of new pads looks like So that's a new pad right there. So you can see how much material is available. And you can see down in there that those are almost completely gone. So I was thinking I might let them go a little longer, but now after seeing this new pad, I'm just gonna replace it because that's really, really quite something back there. So I'm gonna replace those pads. New versus old. You can see quite a bit of difference in, in thickness. So technically I could have got a little bit more life out of these pads, but since we're here doing it, let's put some new pads on. Now it comes the fun part. All we have to do is the flushing. Hose. This hose has a one-way valve on it. You don't need the one-way valve, but if you have it, great. So we're gonna do one side at a time. I'm gonna start with the far side. There, so you don't need the fancy brake tool if you don't need it. You can just use a standard socket or, um, sorry, a wrench and just put your fuel hose over top. And now all you gotta do is crank this open, press the brake pedal, and then crank this close. You'll have one, one hand here and one hand on the brake pedal. And you should be able to reach if you're an adult. Um, and then you just go. Um, open the reservoir up so you can see what's happening. Be careful you don't spray yourself in the face and uh, keep the reservoir above its level so that you don't suck air back into the system and then have to bleed it all over again. Okay, well, so let's get going. Okay, just to show you what's going on in here. It's 
Now that's open, you can see there's a, there will be a level mark in the side, and there's also a level mark on the side of the reservoir. So just try to respect that. And as you're flushing it, you want to see that moving through the system, um, and then keep it topped up. Once you get past flushing stage and you're going back to where you're supposed to be, you want to set it to the mark that is indicated on the, on the, the side of the, the reservoir. Um, if you're going to rebuild the brakes and do the redo the seals, now is a good time. Uh, I'm not going to rebuild my seals at this point, but, um, but if you were going to redo it, you can take the whole system apart and this would be an excellent time to do that. So we fill it up to the max line. I'm just gonna put this back in place. I'm gonna put the cap back on. Make sure the brake pedal feels good. It seems to work okay. And now we just gotta clean up. The best thing to clean up with a brake fluid like this is, well, brake cleaner. I just give it a little spray. And I'll put some down my hose, the fuel hose that I use, just so that it's free from brake fluid. Last we're going to do is put on the air box and once the air filter and the air box is in place then I think we're pretty well done with the carpet. Okay the air filter goes in because one side's got a fine filter the other side's got a coarse filter and then there's a couple little plastic holders. These plastic holders just to kind of help make sure the filter doesn't get deflected and it just tucks up on the inside. So you can see the air filter is in place, the engine is in place, chain guard, catch can, exhaust, the braking system has been flushed, battery is in place and charged, we've gone over the new wiring harnesses with the Micron, we checked all the bumpers, we zip tied the front bumper in place. The only thing left to do is to check the tire pressures and make sure the suspension is where it needs to be. And we'll do that in another video. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned a little bit about what it takes to put the go-kart onto the road. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the track.